What is praiseworthy? A business that has now existed for close to two centuries? A product made to help and ease distress, but also one that brings pleasure, enjoyment, and comfort? A product born out of the wars that liberated a continent whose preparation kept a secret to this day while its distribution spread the world over? Yes, such things are praiseworthy. And worthy to have a claim are the men and women who have guided the destiny of this grand old firm, who over the years of its existence have produced unique blends of the world's finest rums, establishing the largest and most modern rum distillery in the English-speaking Caribbean. We welcome you to the house of Angostura, the home of hospitality. I was at the cannonade at Ligny. The booming guns made hideous figures of fire in the smoke. The smoke was so thick as to almost take away the day. I myself was with the third corps de chasseurs as a surgeon. We had set up a field hospital where an old dry ditch met a myrtle hedge, stretched a canvas over a fallen oak, and went to work on the wounded who came to us by the wagon road. Some faces I will never forget. I was just 19 years old. After the charge had routed the French and the volley of cannon still could be heard, we worked by lamplight. Saws and knives now dull. We took off legs and arms and stuffed our hands into wounds to find the bullets. Sometimes we found buttons, stones, pieces of metal, bits of bone. Waterloo. In fact, it was waterless. That night in the battlefields, there was a cry heard over and over. Water! Water! Men died for want of water. Yet the course of history had been altered. The great duke had been heard to say, Night or the Prussians must come. And we did. Through the thundering dusk, the lingering twilight, we came. The boy who had heard the cannon roar and who had sewn off or stitched up hundreds of limbs that dreadful day in June 1815 on the Brussels Road, close to a place called Waterloo, was Johann Benjamin Siegert. Fate had placed him at a confluence of history, albeit at the very edge of a great battle. So although he hardly witnessed the action, he saw with his own eyes and touched with his hands much suffering. He had been born in 1796 at Gross Valditz in Silesia and was remembered as a brilliant boy. He studied medicine at the University of Berlin, the capital of Prussia. When the emperor of the French, Napoleon Bonaparte, escaped the prison island of Elba to once again plunge Europe into war, Johann joined the Prussian army. He was attached to the third corps de chasseurs at Magdeburg as a surgeon in the campaign of the Allies against the Emperor. His commanding officer, General Gerhard von Blücher, had helped defeat Napoleon at the Battle of Leipzig and had led the Prussian troops into Paris in 1814. His intervention in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 won the day for the Allies. But the confluence of the waters of history that day and personal destiny held in common a distant island for two men who were there. That distant island was Trinidad de Barlovento, or to the windward in the Caribbean Sea. One man had known it in his past, and the other, Dr. Johann Siegert, would never know it, but his sons would, and their children's children for more than 150 years. The business they would establish there would grow to become one of that island's most treasured institutions. The one who had known it in his past was General Sir Thomas Picton. He had been the first British governor there, a tough, hard-fighting Welshman 
He was in command of the Scots Greys and the Gordon Highlanders at Waterloo when they received the charge from the French infantry. He died in the midst of a Highland regiment that had formed a square in defense of the colors that glorious day. For Johann Siegert, the call of adventure, perhaps the call to arms, was still ringing in his ears. He and the company of a party of German noblemen set sail for South America, where the wars of liberation conducted by Simon Bolivar, one of the greatest figures the Western Hemisphere was ever to experience, were arriving at a high point, a crucial stage. Johann Siegert was once again at the crossroads of history as a doctor in the service of humanity. Spain, weakened by war, her valor spent, was facing the dissolution of her empire in the New World. By 1810, five years before Waterloo, independence movements in Venezuela and New Granada, which was to become Colombia, were being formed. The most important of the revolutionary leaders was Simon Bolivar, a Creole born in 1783 in Caracas, the Venezuelan capital. Bolivar's efforts to liberate Northern South America had arrived at a low point in 1815, when he decided to abandon efforts to take Caracas and concentrate instead on the Orinoco region in the northeast of the country. He established his base of operations at Angostura on the Orinoco River. Angostura, the Narrows. There he carried out the detailed planning necessary for his new strategy. He would attack up the Orinoco, across the Andes, and strike at Bogota. The Battle of Carabobo defined the birth of the Republic of Colombia. Dr. Johann Siegert joined this war and became Surgeon General. The town of Angostura, now Ciudad Bolivar, where he was posted in that capacity at the military hospital, was the capital of the province of Guyana. A tiny port surrounded by an amazing jungle on the banks of a huge river running to the sea, its massive delta fanning out to make the Gulf of Paria and to shape over the ages the island of Trinidad, a mere 60 hours sail from Angostura. The war ended, Dr. Siegert, now a respected figure in the community, married and rested. His first wife, Maria del Pilar Araujo, died after bearing several children. He then remarried Isabel Duasan Gomez de Sa, whose family were friends of the famous naturalist Alexander von Humboldt. He and von Humboldt, as fellow Germans and men of science in this wild place, became friends. The remedies he concocted, distillations of herbs and plants said by the native Amerindians to cure or aid, had been a comfort to Bolivar's soldiers. One of these potions, one he had been experimenting on for several years, he had created for his own use. This particular preparation he named Amargo Aromatico, aromatic bitters. It is said that at first he administered it only to his patients and close friends, but soon it acquired a reputation beyond its medicinal virtues because of the special flavor and pleasing aroma it imparted to cordials, punches, and other alcoholic drinks. One always felt better having enjoyed it, a genuine aromatic therapy that was to withstand changing taste and lifestyles for more than 170 years. Its use in cooking would distinguish Caribbean cuisine for generations. He kept its preparation a secret. This little port at Angostura received trade, sometimes via Port of Spain, Trinidad, from all over the world, and soon the bitters of Dr. Siegert of Angostura began to be known. The first shipment was exported in 1830. The business prospered and the size of the shipments grew. In the meantime, a small but hard-working community of Germans had settled in Port of Spain. Amongst these was Karl Booz and the firm of Harrimans. Using their agency, a company was formed to handle the export of aromatic bitters to the world. It was named J. G. B. Siegert y Hijo, meaning and son. The island of Trinidad, formerly a Spanish possession, was at that time a British crown colony. It was well developed and possessed a sugarcane based economy. In fact, Trinidad was soon to boast the second largest factory for the production of sugar in the empire. 
As a result, a fledgling rum industry blossomed, quite varied and very robust. Carlos Damaso was Dr. Johann Siegert's eldest son by his second wife. Don Carlos, as he became known, was born on the banks of the higher reaches of the Orinoco, but he had already become familiar with some of the great cities of Europe by his twenties. The Vienna of the Emperor Franz Joseph, the Paris of Napoleon III, the inauguration of the Champs-Élysées. All of this meant the creation of a middle-class bourgeois reality to drive the Industrial Revolution that installed a consumer society in Western Europe and the New World. Carlos Damaso understood that he was in possession of the secret to a unique new product. Born from war, it was to thrive in peace. He exhibited at London in 1862 and sampled his product. It was applauded with gin, the monotony of which was forever altered. He exhibited in Paris in 1867 and in Vienna in 1873. Bon vivant, impeccable in his dress and manners, he was amongst the first of the advertisers. He visited Philadelphia in the United States in 1876 and far away Australia in 1879. The hallmark of Angostura aromatic bitters was established against the imitators that suddenly appeared to flatter and endorse its success. It was the signature of his father, Dr. J. G. B. Siegert, between the two representations of the Medal of Merit, the highest distinction available which had been awarded in 1873. In Trinidad, Carlos Damaso befriended William Warner, the Attorney General, for many years. After the death of his father, and against the backdrop of the wars of retribution sweeping Venezuela, he decided to take his family to Trinidad. His friend, the Governor Sir Henry Turner Irving, introduced and had passed an ordinance under which it would be possible for bitters to be manufactured in bond in Trinidad. The formula, a secret, would only ever be known by one of two men at a time. By 1880, his brothers, Alfredo and Luis, had joined him in business, and the old Roman Catholic Presbytery on George Street was acquired as the firm's head office. In the relatively peaceful political climate of Trinidad, the firm prospered, and the fame of Dr. J.G.B. Siegert's aromatic bitters spread, with appointments to supply the royal households of Prussia, Spain, Sweden, and England. On July 4, 1895, the sailing bark, the Dr. Siegert, en route to Europe with a cargo of pitch in barrels, coconuts, and cases of Angostura bitters, sank in the Grand Boca off Trinidad's northwestern peninsula, where she was holed on the rocks. Fortunately, there was no loss of life. As a society changes, so too must the institutions that serve it. The House of Angostura diversified its interest into land and was instrumental in the creation of the suburb of Woodbrook. To this day, the streets recall their names, playful, foreign, yet familiar. Carlos, Gallus, Anna, Rosalino, Petra, Alfredo. The large neighborhood thoroughfares framing the memories of its residents for generations. Up sunlit afternoon, the sky washed a clear blue all the way to Venezuela. Don Carlos now gone, Alfredo Cornelio came to the helm of the House of Angostura. Very highly educated in Germany, he was good at figures and could speak many languages. He was amongst those who introduced the telephone to Trinidad. He served on its board of directors and was involved in insurance. He was a visionary and invested heavily in a future which he felt would happen, but it didn't. The huge sums of money, the family's money, he had staked in land at Chagaramas on dredging the Great Bay with the view of connecting it by rail to Port of Spain, were dashed by the undermining of his enemies, men with no vision and even less stature. It was a wonderful idea still ahead of its time. The value of the company's shares fell dramatically. With Alfredo unable to settle his debts, the assets of the House of Angostura passed into the hands of its creditors who sold them. In the meanwhile, Angostura's shares, which had long been registered on the London Stock Exchange, were being bought up at a rate. Wise investors knew 
that while the family may have faltered, the product and its good name the world over were of immense value. But by 1919, with the collapse of the European economy following the Great War, even this valued elixir could hardly find a market. There was great poverty in the world. Alfredo Cornelio's son, Alfredo Gallo, now the sole possessor of the secret, continued to produce Angostura products, the aromatic bitters and various blends of rum in considerably reduced circumstances. Rum, a byproduct of the sugarcane industry, had long been established in these islands. Tall tales of pirates, grand naval encounters, battles fought on land and upon the high seas over tiny green fertile islands whose sole purpose was a production of the cane from which came sugar, molasses and rum. The romance of rum distinguishes the Caribbean in a manner not dissimilar to what whiskey had done for the highlands of Scotland and the vine for the Levant. Rum for England's navy, which now ruled the waves, rum shipped in the holes of Canadian merchantmen, returning north after discharging cargoes of timber, ice, potatoes, and salted fish. Trinidad's rum, Angostura's rum, was pleasing to the palates of the world. In 1921, Points Mackenzie, an entrepreneur, bought up all the shares of Angostura that he could find and gained control of the business. Together with his friend Fritz Booz, he bought the sugar factory at St. Madeline. He also invested in the oil industry. However, markets were collapsing all over the world and he was forced to sell his shares, which then became widely dispersed. The distilling of rum had not yet become a science and was still an art passed on from father to son as a family tradition. Manuel Fernandez emigrated from Madeira in the early 1880s and arrived in Trinidad with his son, Joseph Gregorio Fernandez, who was then five years old. He established himself at 25 Henry Street and advertised as a wine and spirits merchant and sold Madeira wine and Scotch whiskey. Joseph Gregorio had the art of blending as a gift. And when in 1932, the government rum bond was partially burned, he was able to acquire rum that had been put into casks in 1919. This 13 year old rum he blended and marketed as 1919 quite successfully. And after the stock had been sold out, he blended a very similar rum that he called Fernandez Vat 19. The period between the wars was a time in the United States of a prohibition on alcohol. This served to increase the demand. Huge stocks of rum lay embarreled in vast bonds in various islands of the Caribbean. Rum was shipped to Central America and to Canada, and from there found its way to the speakeasies and music halls of the Roaring Twenties. Alfredo Gallo, bought in bulk from Fernandez and others to produce his own blends of rum. Joseph Gregorio was a master blender. His son Bento, who was born in 1903, was a man possessed of considerable drive and ambition. In 1930, in a venturesome move, he bought from the Henderson family the Forest Park Sugar Estate that possessed a still. It was a move that many criticized, but one that paid off handsomely in the long run. He extended the bond at Edward Street, which had been established by his grandfather, Manuel. He worked to create a large distillery, and during the Second World War, sent bottles of VAT-19 rum to the soldiers of the West India Regiment on active service in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Indeed, every Trinidadian serviceman on active duty abroad received a bottle of VAT-19 rum just about every month. From very humble beginnings, his firm would grow into an economic giant and later impact positively on the house of Angostura. Drink rum and Coca-Cola, go down Point Kumana, see father, mother and daughter working for the Yankee dollar. Hundreds of thousands of servicemen, mostly Americans, came to Trinidad and changed forever the fabric of national life. Boisterous sailors thronged Park Street and Green Corner. Brothels, bars, and gambling halls thrived. For those who survived the battles of the Atlantic, the wars in the Pacific, and for the freedom of Europe, 
The taste of Trinidad rum, diluted with their own Coca-Cola, flavored by the aroma of Angostura bitters, was a happy memory of a peaceful island full of fun-loving people. Alfredo Gallo, hardly in a position to control, continued to report to work every day. The company no longer in the family's hands, he had but one tremendous hold. He was the keeper of the secret formula. He, however, knew that the future of Angostura lay in its stocks of old, fine rums, those huge, dark, oaken, silent casks, filling the old bond at George Street, shafts of gold, slanting from the skylights, the shouts of the cartermen in the street, the tolling of the bells from the city's ancient cathedral church, time passing until the time was right. Robert, Alfredo Gallo's son, qualified as a chemist. He was the first to study science since the time of his great-grandfather, Dr. Johann Siegert. He knew that the reins of the firm and the secret of this old business now in existence for more than 100 years, would soon pass into his hands. Some years before the war in 1937, he had successfully lobbied the board of directors for the establishment of a chemical control and research laboratory. He had decided to produce a range of premium rums. As the post-war period commenced, Robert Siegert moved decisively to take the company into the second half of the 20th century. In need of a first-rate chemist and someone with a background in the blending of rum, Robert called upon the talents of Albert Gomez, who was wooed away from a position in Guyana. Later, he encouraged Thomas Gatcliffe, another chemist, to join the firm. The work of this team in that formative time produced over the next few years blends of rum of significant quality in their flavor and smoothness. One of these blends they would come to name Angostura Old Oak Rum. The name Angostura had by this time become an icon synonymous with Trinidad, Airi, the land of the hummingbird. Angostura had made history is true, but the ending of the battle at Waterloo, Dr. Seagat made personal sacrifice, experimenting with botanical herbs and spice. Its initial purpose was to set things right for upset stomach and poor appetite. So Angostura was destined for prosperity, for the set up of health and to remedy. Calypsonians sang proudly of it and placed it alongside such significant attributes as the famous Pitch Lake at La Bray and the island's world-renowned sportsman. On the world stage, Angostura Bitters was more than just fashionable. It was an indication of sophistication, of being in touch with the finer elements of taste. It would be true to say that there would hardly have been a top quality public bar with any pretension to style in Western Europe and the USA, that would not have had a bottle of Angostura bitters on the shelf. The company also bore the distinction of being one of two local establishments to be listed on the London Stock Exchange. Now the company would distinguish itself with its rum production. In 1949, Trinidad Distillers Limited was established as a wholly owned subsidiary of the House of Angostura. This modern distillery demonstrated the success achieved in extensive research into the processes of fermentation and distillation. The House of Angostura was now a major rum producer with ever-increasing assets in more ways than one. Chemist A. L. Gomez, who spearheaded the research project and designed the distillery itself, was its first managing director. He also became deputy chairman of the House of Angostura and a keeper of the secret. The 1950s brought dramatic changes to both the company and to Great Britain's crown colonies, with the granting of independence in many territories. In Trinidad and Tobago, the dynamic and to some messianic figure of Dr. Eric Eustace Williams rose to dominate the politics of independence. In command of a significant grasp of the world scene under the real politic at home, he lost no time in demonstrating patriotic sentiment when in 1958, a distributor from the U.S. made a bid for the company with a view to removing its principal assets to Bermuda. After careful consideration, it was decided an approach should be made to the chief minister himself for guidance and help. 
Agreement was finally reached that the Trinidad government would buy up the majority shares and in so doing, possess the controlling interest in the House of Angostura. At a cost of $1,769,663, the government thus thwarted the effort of Canadian businessman Douglas Bradley to gain control, reported the Trinidad Guardian of August 31, 1958. It continued, the government took the unusual step of twice outbidding Mr. Bradley, who had set up a holding company in tax-free Bermuda, out of fear that the unique Trinidad product would be taken out of the territory with a consequent loss of jobs, taxes, and prestige. The deal done, Dr. Eric Williams, smiling broadly to a reporter, remarked, everybody looks happy. And the jobs and taxes the chief minister was talking about were not purely confined to Angostura. They also included the sugar industry employing thousands. King Sugar of the previous century had a central role to play in the economic development of the country. The sugar crops reaped annually in Trinidad's central heartland produced as a byproduct the molasses from which, when refined, distilled, and blended, came some of the world's best rums. The House of Angostura played a leading role in this endeavor. The returns realized by the government on its Angostura investments were significantly larger than any of its overseas investments made in that period. This historic move to preserve the company for the nation was further enhanced by the government's stated intent to resell the shares to private enterprise. Seagirt Holdings Limited was formed for the purpose of bidding for the shares and all the employees were invited to subscribe. After 40 years, the controlling interest of the company came once more into the hands of the family. Robert Seagirt invited Thomas Gatcliffe to join the board of directors. He was appointed on February 6th 1959. By the early 1960s, a significant milestone in the history of the House of Angostura was passed when profits on rum exceeded that on bitters for the first time. Since then, rum has steadily lengthened its lead. The House of Angostura's significant achievement was brought about during this period by the endeavor of Robert Seagert, Albert Gomez, and Tommy Gatliffe. A team of dedicated scientists, they had managed to achieve an unusual blend of age-old art with modern science, the result being the production of an exceptionally fine quality light rum on a continuous still. The quality of the blends now produced was a far cry from the original blends of the 1930s, for Angostura was amongst the first rum manufacturers in Trinidad to operate on the basis of its own pure yeast cultures, painstakingly isolated from their natural habitat by the company's chemists. Rum is made from the fermentation of molasses by the addition of yeast. From the many hundreds of strains isolated and appraised, only the best are selected for continuous culture in the company's microbiological laboratory. This means that Angostura, by the use of different yeasts, can make many different types of basic rums, ranging in body from heavy to light, which are used in the blending process. It was at this juncture that the art of making rum had truly given way to the science of its production. Angostura's old oak rums dominated the marketplace in the 1960s, defining the taste, bouquet, and smoothness of Trinidad rum for a generation. Exporting to the world at large, diversifying into the production of gin, vodka, and the famous Mokatika coffee liqueur, as well as many brands of rum, brought the company into the limelight as a major hard currency earner, gaining in 1972 the prestigious Export Performance Trophy. So as to facilitate the demands for export, the company in the early 1980s created a bulk export terminal at Shagaramas. This became the port of call for the Proof Galant, the company's bulk exporting vessel, which would take the distilled spirits produced by Angostura to the world. Increasing sales of Angostura aromatic bitters have continued to define the taste of Caribbean cooking. A dash of bitters enhances the aroma and quickens the taste buds. It is to many cooks the secret ingredient for stews, roasts, sauces, and soups. A drop 
brings out the best flavors in desserts. And a bottle of Angostura in the kitchen is a hallmark of the excellent cook. Angostura Aromatic Bitters has retained its original formulation, a true trade secret. An international brand that over the centuries has continued to flavor the world's food and its drinks. Social changes in the post-independence period brought about new trends in the marketplace. The House of Angostura, growing exponentially, acquired Fernandez Distilleries in 1973 from Joseph Fernandez. Adding to its product lists, established brand names such as Bat 19, Black Label, White Star, and Ferdies. These, the Fernandez brands, have since then been marketed separately in sometimes fierce competition with the Angostura brands. As one executive remarked, one house, two distinct families. But of much greater importance, it was now in possession of a vast bond filled with casks of aged rums at the Fernandez Industrial Estate at Laventil. During this period, the move away from the old George Street premises to the Fernandez compound at Laventil commenced. Indeed, an era was passing. Robert Seagert retired as chairman in December of 1981, and Thomas Gatliff was elected to the chair in January 1982. The company's culture had always been possessed by a vision of international trade, and with the new management taking control in the early 1960s, it formulated a fresh business point of view. This was based on traditional links, but set against Trinidad's new political and economic realities, new ideas for the politics of independence and for doing business. In 1985, Angus Tura Limited became the proud recipient of a national award, the Hummingbird Gold Medal, for its contribution to industry. It is the first company to be so honored. On November 1st of that year, the company was extremely honored when Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II visited the plant on the occasion of a state visit to Trinidad and Tobago. Her Majesty unveiled a plaque which commemorated the completion of the phased distillery expansion, an expansion which increased the plant's annual capacity from 5 to 8 million liters of rum. As the proud holder of a royal warrant of appointments to the Queen, the unveiling of the plaque was especially significant to the firm. In fact, the royal warrant to provide Angostura aromatic bitters to the royal household had been held by the company during several reigns. The distinction is a unique one in that it is granted by royal grace and favor to firms that have achieved excellence and have maintained an extraordinary standard of quality. Always outward looking, the company proceeded to form strategic alliances and joint ventures, significantly with Bacardi, a long-established producer of rum operating internationally. Bacardi, over a period of time, became a major shareholder in the Angostura group of companies. In 1997, while retaining their trading relationship with the group, Bacardi sold its shareholding to CL Financial, one of the largest holding companies in the Caribbean. Once again, ownership of the House of Angostura returned to the hands of National. The company exports some 85% of its production to almost every country in the world. Significant markets have been found in the USA, Europe, Australia, and more recently, Japan. In 1991, there was further expansion of the distillery. Fermentation and distillation capacities more than doubled in that year to some 20 million liters of rum. In 1995, the House of Angostura was distinguished by the achievement of the ISO 9002 certification. In so doing, the company became the first distillery in the Caribbean to obtain this international quality standard. Prime Minister, the Honorable Basdeo Pande, visited the House of Angostura in 1996. After declaring open the new 20-acre complex, accommodating offices and warehouses, he commissioned the company's state-of-the-art bottling line. The 
The line has a capacity to produce in excess of 3 million cases of product per year. This was followed by the opening of the new Angostura Sources Manufacturing Facility. Relocated from its original home in the US, the facility is designed to produce for export Angostura Wooster, teriyaki, soy, and other sauces, along with its Bloody Mary mix. Today, the consolidated strength of the Angostura group of companies is a reflection of its growth from a small manufacturing concern that had its origins in the early 19th century. The House of Angostura was honored in its 173rd year in 1997 when Trinidad Distillers Limited, the manufacturing arm of the company, received from the Prime Minister the prestigious Exporter of the Year Award. The House of Angostura, mindful of its origins, has over the years created its marketing and public relations programs to, wherever possible, reflect and be relevant to its environment. The company has contributed to the development of both individuals and sporting bodies, such as those concerned with horse racing, cricket, and yachting. Angostura helped to create a world-class regatta in Tobago. This event increasingly draws yachtsmen and visitors to enjoy the unique pleasures of Tobago and to serve to develop that island's tourism potential while enhancing the House of Angostura's global image. The company's involvement with sport has touched the lives of several outstanding nationals who have benefited from their association with the group. The company has had an ongoing relationship with the Trinidad and Tobago Cricket Board that has helped the team win the regional cricket championship on more than one occasion. In the cultural field, the House of Angostura has made its contribution as well with active support for the steel band and calypso movements. The vision for the future is one that sees the company competing effectively while diversifying its interests, trading successfully with its main competitors, creating new markets, maintaining the integrity of its products, seeking out new technologies while continuing in the production of the best quality rums. The House of Angostura is undoubtedly one of the grand firms of the Caribbean. Its roots firmly planted in this land, it has passed as the precious thing that it is from one hand to another over the centuries. It continues to position itself at this the turn of the century to enter and to meet the challenges of the new millennium.